A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I got really adventurous this past week. I ventured into the world of TikTok <laughs> to see who were its top 10 influencers around the world. Actually, of the top 10, the only name I recognized was Will Smith, the actor. Number five on the list was called Mr. Beast. That sounded positive. <laughs> Number one was Cabane Lamy. And I am so sorry if I've got that pronunciation wrong. But Cabane has got 162 million subscribers around the world. He is based in Italy. And he was closely followed at number two by Charlie D'Amelio from America. Ah, you thought that was a guy, didn't you? It's a she. She is a dancer and has 151 million followers. Now, these social media stars have no direct contact with their devotees. And yet the fact is that they are influencing millions and millions of folks uh, around the world. It's really quite amazing. Here is my point in sharing my exciting adventure with TikTok. We live in an age of misinformation. And it is vitally important that you decide well in choosing who to listen to. My question to you this morning is, who are you allowing to influence your decisions. Hold on to that thought, please, as we turn uh, to our passage that Lorraine read so beautifully for us. You may recall from last Sunday that Colin uh, told us that Jesus had just called his band of 12. Remember that? And this group, of young rookie disciples headed out at a fair clip on this adventure of a lifetime. 
Scripture tells us that they head, first of all, to Capernaum. And when Sunday comes, they go to church. Their equivalent, of course, was the Sabbath. And being Jews, they went to the synagogue. Jesus, being the itinerant rabbi, was going to teach that morning in the synagogue. I guess it had the makings of a pretty normal day in church. The normal teaching was given by a group in the Jewish hierarchy called the scribes. Problem was they simply put the common people to sleep. Normal was to sit for ages listening to dreary, repetitive, boring teaching, which was as dry as dust and which did not change or challenge their lives one iota. Their teaching simply did not scratch where the people itched. But today was going to be so different. Jesus spoke their language. They could relate and understand what he said. It was so relevant. His words touched a deep chord within them. His words had the ring of truth about them, and they hung on every word. It was a riveting experience. Instead of having their usual snooze, they were literally on the edge of their seats. And the people were amazed, says Scripture, at the authority with which he spoke. So I say to us all, but particularly to our young folks this morning, I want you to listen up. This is one of the reasons you guys need to get in to the Bible. You need to investigate Jesus. You need to use all the energy of your fertile young minds to explore the four accounts of Jesus' life. To discover who he really is. To explore what he said and how he followed up his words with action because that is what gave him such authority every time he spoke because he did what he said. You cannot ignore this central figure of all of history. You simply have to research him just as rigorously as you would any of your school or university subjects. So that's the first thing. His amazing authority every time he spoke. Now, in the middle of all this excellence, suddenly a demon-possessed man interrupted the proceedings in the synagogue. I think, folks, that the very presence of Jesus seriously unsettled these agents of Satan and seriously ruffled the devil's feathers. That's what I think. They were intent on disrupting the impact of Jesus' teaching. I want you to notice three simple things about these evil spirits who were tormenting this dear man um, in the synagogue. Number one, they knew precisely who Jesus was. That was verse uh, 24. Did you notice it? What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. As to his human origin, they knew that he was Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary and Joseph. As to his divinity, 
They knew that he was the Holy One of God. They got it. This unique dual nature of the Christ, fully human and fully divine, in one glorious person, and the demons of hell were fully aware of it. James 2, 19, in James' epistle, he said, You believe that there is one God? Good, good for you. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. Even the demons believe and tremble. That's what James said. So they knew precisely who Jesus was. Secondly, they obeyed him. That's verses 25 and 26. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. They knew precisely um, who he was, they obeyed precisely what he ordered. Again, with tremendous authority, Jesus commands this unclean spirit to release that poor, demented man. Be muzzled is the term. Actually, it's exactly the same word that Jesus used when he was stilling the storm. You remember that story? Shush. Shush, be quiet. Literally, shut your mouth and come out of him. And with a vicious, throaty shriek, the demon obeys. They knew precisely who Jesus was. They obeyed exactly what he said. Third, they admitted that their future was in his hands. Look at what they said to Jesus uh, in verse 24. Have you come to destroy us? And Matthew, in his account, adds this. Have you come to destroy us before the time? These nefarious agents of evil understood that there was a day coming when they would get their comeuppance. And the judge on that day before whom they would stand is none other than the one who with tremendous power had expelled them from persecuting this dear man in the synagogue. They knew that. They knew precisely who Jesus was. They obeyed him, precisely what he said. And they acknowledged that their future was in his hands. Here's what we learn from this. Jesus has power over the kingdom of darkness and over the forces of evil in our world. We call it these days the dark side, like the dark side of the web. Jesus will destroy forever all the evil designs of the devil. As you sit in church this morning, are you deeply concerned about all the acts of unspeakable evil being perpetrated on this planet, even as we speak? You should be. Good for you if you're concerned. But I want you to hear this. Jesus will destroy forever all the evil designs of Satan to enslave people in one kind of addiction or another. Because at the end of the day, it's down to people. It's down to individuals. 
That's what really matters. The people in the synagogue that day summed it up perfectly in, in verse number 27. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? And with such authority, he even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. They had never ever heard anyone speak with such authority. And they had never witnessed such spiritual power being wielded right before their very eyes. Someone says, hey, nice story, preacher. But what's it got to do with me in January 2024? And I say, folks, it's got everything to do with you. Because here's the really exciting news that you've come to church to hear this morning. Jesus wants to put that power to work in your life this very day. To forgive all the skeletons in your cupboard. All that stuff from the past that you're ashamed of. He wants to take all these broken pieces of your life and make you whole. That's what Jesus excels at doing. Let me tell you about my pal, Tom Honkinen. Tom was and is a brilliant engineer. He was a Harley man. Just to give you context, when we were living in Wisconsin, we were about an hour and a half north of Milwaukee where the headquarters of the Harley-Davidson company were, right? So it was Harley-Davidson territory. And all the Harley guys would bring their rides to Tom to keep them in top condition. He was a popular guy. The problem with Tom was that whenever he got paid, he would hit the bar and drink away most of his profits. His wife, Lisa, was just the best. What a girl. A stalwart member of Hope Church where we served. But Lisa was living in deep despair at the toll that alcohol was taking on Tom's health. So she prayed a little heart out until Tom finally, after years, bottomed out. He cried out in his brokenness, Lord, if you are really there, I'm going to stop living in denial. I really need your help. I am so broken. Will you save me? And he did. What an unbelievable change. That's real power. Right there. Gradually, Tom and Lisa got on their feet financially and they bought a fixer-upper in the village where we lived. And the last memory I have of Tom and Lisa, just before we come back to the UK, they invited me and me to lunch in their home. He had used all his skills to renovate this beat-up house and to turn it into a lovely home. And here was Tom, beaming from ear to ear, at peace with the world and sitting in his right mind, sharing lunch with his Scottish pastor. Somebody cynical might say, huh, that's American stuff, it doesn't happen here in the old country. No. Let me take you back to the early days of our marriage when 
our kids were born and brought up in Bothwell, we had lovely neighbours. They were called Colin and Linda. We befriended them as a family, and when they went on holiday, I would uh, cut their grass. When his banger that he used to get to work wouldn't start on the cold mornings, I helped um, Colin to bump start it. And when Linda's parents were really sick, we would look after the kids when they went to visit at the hospital. Linda loved the Lord and was a regular in church along with the kids. Colin wasn't negative and he came along with the rest of the family from time to time, but somehow he never could bring himself to the point of taking that vital step of faith. I want you to fast forward now 35 years, yet yeah, three Five, 35 years. And by that time, we had had our 20-year American adventure and we had just returned to Scotland. I was sitting on this, in this very sanctuary just waiting for uh, the service to begin. Just over there where uh, Moira is sitting right now. And as I was waiting, I got a text from my friend Andrew confession time, I broke the rules and I read the text. But here's what it said. John, I thought you would like to know that last Sunday in the Church of Scotland View Park, Colin Bendel finally made the decision to follow Christ. So it just does happen here. In my 72 years, here's what I've learned. Number one, we are all incredibly broken. Every single one of us. And two, only Jesus has the power to make us whole. Friends, no doctor or psychiatrist on this planet can argue with the power of a life radically changed for the better. That is what Jesus does. That is why I'm a Christian. That is why I still count it an honor to speak to you about him. I leave the final word to God himself. The words written by Luke chapter 9 verse 35. It was that amazing occasion when on that holy mount Jesus met uh, with Moses and Elijah. And in the midst of their conversation, God split open in the heavens and bellowed to earth. This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen. Listen to him. My question is, who are you listening to? Let's pray together. All morning, Father, we've been focusing on this singular greatest event in all of history. When your son gave himself as an atoning sacrifice for all our fears and problems and sins and brokenness, all of it, were heaped upon him so that we could be made whole. Just like the dear man in the synagogue these many, many centuries ago. We pray, Lord, that we will be good listeners 
There is so much junk out there. The internet gives a platform to anybody to uh, pro, just to proclaim anything, whether it be good or bad. So give us wisdom. And I, I pray especially for our young people, Lord, that when they are bombarded with all this information, hitting them right, left, and center, that you will give them by your spirit tremendous wisdom to make wise choices on who they listen to and in particularly to investigate Jesus and get to know the truth about him. This we pray in his mighty name. Amen.